Okay, our next speaker is um, Eliasif, who is um, a professor of Hebrew literature at Tel Aviv University, where he has directed Ofakim, which is a three-year program that trains exceptional students to teach Judaism as culture um, in Israeli state schools. Uh, Dr. Yassif's publications include The Tale of Ben Sira in the Middle Ages, a critical text and literary, uh, a critical text and literary studies. Um, uh, uh, I'm not going to read all of these because I want to get him started, but I want you to know that he's a folklorist and I think has probably very interesting things to say that will comment on both some of the kinds of questions that Ted's um, presentation has um, opened up for us and comment um, also on some of the sessions in the morning. I also want to say that um, Professor Yosef is also a um, the head of the Academic Advisory Committee um, uh, in Israel for the Posen Foundation and has been a really important scholar who's really opened up um, the study of secular Jewish culture um, in Israel. And we really are very, very fortunate to have him with us. I, I'm not going to uh, comment, of course, on everything that uh, happened today, uh, but I would like uh, to uh, refer only to two, uh, two, two things. Uh, about Seinfeld, um, uh, when uh, we were, when I was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, we had uh, neighbors, uh, two uh, um, a professor from, from Wales. And we became very, very good friends and we were together almost every day. And one day, uh, we said at about uh, 7 p.m., uh, there is a Seinfeld uh, <coughs> episode. Please come, we'll have a, we'll have a wine. And, uh, and they said, no, we, we don't like Seinfeld. And we couldn't believe it. Is anybody a person that doesn't like Seinfeld? And we said, why? How? And they said, it's too Jewish. <coughs> And I can say that from that moment on, our relationship deteriorated <laughs> and <laughs> somehow. And, uh, but, uh, but, but, but this, is, this is the reality. I mean, uh, even if uh, we might say, as we heard now, that many of the characters um, in this series are not Jewish, it doesn't matter. Yeah, Seinfeld is a Jewish theme. And, uh, and uh, uh, as, as you said, a lot of studies um, uh, described it, so, so we shouldn't be surprised about it. <clears throat> the, the second um, um, uh, thing, the theme I want to refer to uh, that has to do with the previous lectures is that we're celebrating in Israel now um, 100 years to the kibbutz. And in Israel, it is a big thing. I mean, in every uh, 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 area you can think of, of the culture and music and history and politics and, and everything. Uh, the first kibbutz, uh, uh, the Ganya, uh, was founded about 100 years ago. And uh, uh, I would say that I was a little bit surprised that uh, the term kibbutz wasn't mentioned here more <coughs> because I think that uh, uh, what the kibbutz was first and foremost was the boldest attempt to live Jewish secular life for the first time, whole Jewish secular life. Not only uh, ideals, not only philosophy, but to live everyday life, to support themselves in, in, in agriculture, to build a community, to raise a family, to have uh, attitudes towards sex, Nomi, that's what you, you, you spoke about. <clears throat> Everything was in the kibbutz. And uh, uh, this bold attempt uh, is a proof, I think, uh, that Jewish secular life is possible. <clears throat> this is something that can be lived at. And uh, the achievements of the kibbutz, although there were so many changes, of course, uh, and so many difficulties along the way uh, uh, should be served as a, as a, uh, a proof that, um, uh, that the secular is not only an idea but also a practice. Okay, <clears throat> um, let, let's, let's turn to the theme that I wanted to, um, 
to speak about uh, this afternoon about Jewish folklore as a venue to, um, um, to a secular uh, idea or to secular life. <clears throat> um, one of the um, uh, difficulties I, as a folklorist, have um, with the study of secularism is the fact that it concentrates mainly on the upper level of Jewish society. And I think that even what we heard here today is an example for that. Whenever we're talking about secularism, we're speaking about philosophy, about history. <clears throat> uh, we don't tend usually to get deeper into the question how these ideologies of um, uh, Jewish secularism penetrated into the larger parts of Jewish society. Did it at all? Or maybe it only remained on the surface of some philosophers and, and, and intellectuals. Yeah, this is the question that uh, uh, we might use not only sociological, statistical uh, research, but I think that one of the main tools to do it is to study Jewish folklore. And I'll try to explain later on how and why we should do it. The, the, uh, maybe the best example of this kind of weakness in the study of Jewish secularism is um, a, a, a book, or I would say a, an achievement uh, that was finished a couple of years ago in Israel, in Hebrew, and this is called a New Jewish Time. This is a five-volume encyclopedia of a, a secular life that was edited by uh, uh, Irmiao Yovel from, from here, from uh, New Jewish School and the Hebrew University, and by uh, uh, Yair Tzaban, um, uh, the great leader of the uh, secular movement in Israel. And uh, that was founded by the Posen Foundation. <clears throat> now, this is a wonderful compendium or, or encyclopedia that unfortunately was not yet translated into English, but it always has, uh, uh, already have a very deep impact on Israeli education and cultural, cultural discussions uh, in, in, in many fields. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this five volume encyclopedia, you see that there is almost no idea or major figure or movement in the last 200 years that is not mentioned there. Yeah, the, the fifth volume is actually a very detailed uh, index. And uh, you find there everything. Yeah, uh, uh, every uh, Zionist uh, secondary leader, every movement, every way of life. The only word that doesn't exist is Jewish folklore. As if in the last 200 years there was no importance at all to this uh, uh, theme or question. Now, major figures in Jewish folklore, like, for example, Moses Gaster or uh, Solomon uh, Ansky, uh, uh, Solomon Rappaport Ansky, and uh, uh, Mayor Grunwald, and so on and so on. The, the, the founders of Jewish folklore in the 19th century are not mentioned at all. They, as if, again, they didn't have any impact on uh, uh, the, the secular movement or Jewish, Jewish uh, secularism. Now, uh, the question is why, of course. And the answer is because research was concentrated mainly on the upper levels of society. <clears throat> on, uh, as I said before, on, on, on philosophy, on history, on social movements and didn't try to ask themselves, did or were those uh, ideas? Did they penetrate really into the depth of Jewish society? How much impact it had on the larger uh, segments of Jewish society in Europe, in the East, w w wherever we're, uh, uh, we're going to ask these questions. Um, now, <coughs> I will try to bring a couple of examples to that. 
Maybe uh, uh, the most important folklorist of the end of uh, the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century was a name I mentioned before, uh, Salomon Rapoport Ansky, who is known as the author of the D book uh, of the uh, Between, Between the Worlds, uh, the Yiddish uh, uh, play that was translated. Uh, uh, a year after it was composed by Chaim Nachman Bialik into Hebrew, and then, of course, it became history, the, the, the most popular uh, uh, play ever in, in, uh, in, in Jewish culture. Now, uh, Ansky uh, organized uh, two major expeditions to the Pale of Settlement in Poland, Russia, U the, the Ukraine, and in order to collect uh, uh, materials in the most remote villages in those places in the, in the first decade of the 20th century. And um, he brought from there a lot of interesting material, and on which, uh, by the way, he based uh, his, um, his D book, his Between, Between the, world, um, the World's uh, Play. In 1908, uh, Ansky published a, a very um, basic um, a article that is, he called it On Jewish Folklore, where he tried to promote the idea that Jewish folklore is humanistic. Now, uh, let me only uh, mention here something. I don't know if you know the book. Uh, uh, Mr. Moraskin is here. Yes. Where? Where? Okay. Hi. Hello. Shalom. Okay. Now, uh, uh, published uh, 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 a very, uh, uh, I would say, a, a revolutionary book that, in a way, by whatever I said before, I didn't uh, uh, give enough credit to him. And this is the Humanist Readings in Jewish Folklore. Okay. Uh, uh, a very important book that didn't. Uh, have uh, the, the, the right uh, impact it should have. And uh, well, I, I, I taught it whenever, because these are English texts, I taught it whenever I taught here uh, in the United States. I, I used it uh, with my students. Uh, but it should, it should appear also in Hebrew and, and, and used in Israel as well. Now, um, uh, Ansky in 1908 uh, already tried to point at the humanistic uh, tendencies of Jewish folklore. And I'm not going to describe everything he said there, but he brought two examples uh, of uh, Jewish folk tales that are humanistic. The first one was told here in detail by my friend David, and this is the, uh, the story about, um, about not in heaven. Uh, the, the, the tale, the Talmudic tale about the uh, 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 snakes, Achnai, snakes oven. Okay, that story, you remember that David told about Rabbi Eliezer and the voices from heaven, etc. that Ansky considered to be a, a, a humanistic legend, a humanistic Talmudic, uh, Talmudic legend. And then he told the story that he himself collected from the Pale of Settlement in, in Russia in those years. Uh, this is a story about uh, um, the, the uh, Romanian, a, Rom a Romanian king who uh, decided to expel the Jews from Romania. An uh, old uh, uh, man from, from a village uh, burst into the house of Ra Rabbi Elimelech of Lijansk, the, the, the great Hasidic uh, leader, the Hasidic tzaddik, and he demanded with a lot of anger to bring God to court. And uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Elimelech assembled the three elders of the village, and they sat to trial, and they called God to appear before them. And there was a voice. And they started to say why they think that God should be blamed for doing these this, uh, uh, um, horrible things to the Jewish community. And then God admitted his guilt, and after three days, the, um, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, 
redemption was 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 uh, was uh, uh, ended. Um, uh, one legend is uh, Talmudic, another is, is is Hasidic. This is what Ansky had to say about a, a humanistic Jewish folklore, and I would say that it might be humanistic. But it is not, in no way, secular. Why? Not be God because God appears there. This is not the problem. The, the presence or, or absence of God, OK. That's a question that even secular people are contesting with. The serious, the more serious problem here is the involvement of God in everyday life. In the in the in the in the in the human uh, uh, in, in, in the human <coughs> life that uh, uh, have impact on everything they do. The secular idea is not the question if there is God or there is not God, but the question how much God is have impact on human life. How much are we? willing to involve God in what we're doing, in our decisions. And in those two legends, yeah, there is a very clear saying that God has to say about what we're doing, about our lives, about our decisions. So there is no way that I can uh, uh, define these two legends as secular legends. Now, um, let me leave this for a moment. We'll return to it uh, uh, later on. And uh, I would like to say a couple of words about folklore and folk tales, just to, to settle things, to, to, to make them more understandable. <clears throat> a folk tale is not a story about uh, 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 princesses and kings and, uh, and the knights on, on white horses, or about, uh, or about a little red riding hood. A folktale, the definition, the professional definition of a folktale is a story, a tale, that appears in multiple existence. This is the term we're using which means a story that has many versions. Usually, it is totally anonymous. We have no idea who wrote it if, it, it, if it ever was written down. But the fact that a story appears in many versions is a proof that society, that the community, accepted it as part of its cultural heritage. If the community decides to take a story and tell it again and again in different versions, in different times, for different purposes, it means that that community takes this story as part of its heritage. So a folktale is a story, is a tale that was accepted by society and through which society tries to say something, to tell us what society thinks about different things. Now, the fact that a folktale appears in multiple forms Broad scholars already 200 years ago, and we usually consider the beginning of the study of folklore in the early 19th century with the publication of the um, uh, brothers Grimm, Jacob and, 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 uh, and Wilhelm Grimm, uh, of their fairy tale. We consider or, or, or the, the, the first scholars considered the beginning of the study of folklore as comparative. 
Because if there are so many versions, the question is how do we compare the different versions and what do we learn from this comparison? Now, the first Jewish folklorists in the second half of the 19th century, Moses Gaster, who I mentioned before, was a Romanian who left for England and became the chief rabbi of, of uh, the chief Sephardi rabbi of England and was a great folklorist. Or uh, Louis Ginsberg, here in New York, uh, uh, one of the founders of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Or um, uh, um, uh, Rabbi Israel Levy in Paris, who was the chief rabbi of Paris and also a great, uh, uh, a great folklorist. All of them adopted the comparative a study of folklore. They collected Jewish folktales from different, from different sources and compared them to each other, trying to understand the origins of those folktales. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that when we are dealing with religious culture, as Judaism in the 19th century was, and when we compare a Jewish folktale to European or to Arabic or to Indian folktales, we are actually claiming that it, this is a secular story. The comparison is pushing us to understand that a Jewish myth or a Jewish legend, or a Jewish folktale is not unique, but it is part of a universal culture. It expresses general humanity and not only Jewish values. In this version, it is Jewish. It is told in Hebrew, or in Yiddish, or in Ladino, or in uh, uh, Judeo-Arabic, it doesn't matter. And it speaks about Jewish life. But it has versions in Arabic. It has versions in, in, in Scandinavia or in Italy. It has other versions in, in, in China. By, by admitting this, this folklorist actually said or admitted the fact that the folktale is not expressing the uniqueness of Judaism, but that Judaism is part of a general culture. Now, let me only quote um, a, a short passage from one of the greatest folklorists of our time, Professor Alan Dundis, from the late Professor Alan Dundis from Berkeley, who referred directly to this. I'm reading. <coughs> the problem of how to treat apparent or actual parallels to bib biblical material has yet to be solved. If the same narrative exists in a variety of cultures, why is one version of the story singled out as being true or valid, while all others are dismissed as being false or untrue? A possibility is to accept the comparative data as bona fide evidence for the multiple existence of a narrative, thereby confirming the narrative as folklore and to remove it from the sacred canon. canon. In other words, again, <coughs> by using the comparative, the comparative method and by admitting the fact that the story was not or is not uniquely Jewish, you actually accept the values behind it. You accept the idea that this story is uh, universal and so Judaism is part of a general culture and not only something or, or a culture that uh, um, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, unique and outstanding. Now, um, as an, as an uh, how, how, how much time do I have? You have about See? 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, I, I want to, that's fine. I want to, um, uh, uh, as uh, 
um, before me, we saw a Seinfeld uh, um, episode. Let me uh, uh, tell you a short story. As we are dealing here with folk tales, so <clears throat> in a uh, in a medieval um, a composition called the Midrash of the Ten Commandments, uh, from approximately the ninth century, uh, that Midrash is collecting stories around each one of the Ten Commandments. And uh, about or, or, or around the Third Commandment, uh, you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord your God, Lot Yisrael Shem Adonai Lord Chalashav, uh, it tells the following story. Uh, uh, an old man uh, who was about to die he called his son to him and uh, told him, look, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a very rich person, very wealthy and uh, 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 honored by everybody, etc. I uh, achieved all this only because I never swore. <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm demanding from you not to do as I did uh, uh, all your life. Never swear, swear an oath. And the man died, and uh, uh, the boy uh, inherited everything he had. And then one crook heard about, about that uh, um, testament of his father. And he came and said, your father owed me so and so. And he said, no, you, my father couldn't. He said, OK, let's go to court, and, uh, and you'll have to swear. And he didn't want to do it, so he paid to him. Another crew occurred, and, mm -hmm. and so in a short time, this guy didn't have any money at all. Mm. And uh, because he, did, he, he, he simply kept uh, the, the testament of his father. Uh, now, uh, uh, after that, as he didn't have any more money, he was taken to prison because, again, he didn't, he didn't want to, to swear that he, he didn't owe anything. His wife became, uh, started to wash clothes in the, in the river, in the next river, and then came a ship. And uh, as she was a very beautiful woman, the ship kidnapped her, and she disappeared. <coughs> her two sons remained on the shore crying, and uh, uh, they went to their father, and they released him from, from prison and went out for, for uh, uh, starting to wander all over. And then the kids disappeared, the father continued his way, and he became a poor shepherd. And one day, he was so distressed that he decided to put an end to his life. And he saw a, 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 a huge, a huge a, a canyon uh, with a lot of, of, of skeletons in it, and he understood that people simply jumped to that, and he wanted to jump. And then an angel of God came and said to him, uh, uh, um, uh, now you will be rewarded. Um, um, a dig here, you'll find in, in, the, in, the, in the ground, you'll find a great treasure. Buy this land, uh, found a kingdom, you'll become an important king, and uh, God will return to you everything that was taken to you. And that's exactly what he did. And a ship that came to that place brought his his two sons, and another sheep brought his wife in another time, and they returned to be a, 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 a unified family. And the story ends, and this is a, a proof that uh, why a person shouldn't swear an oath all his life. <laughs> this is the story. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, if we're, if we're starting to dig a little bit into the story, we find something very interesting. On the face of it, this is a typical medieval example. That's how this story is called. This is a story that is, uh, um, it was created in order to uh, illustrate the third commandment. It's simple. But what happens in the story is, a very strange, uh, a very strange from the point of view of a, a, a Jewish culture. Because this is not actually a story about a, 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 a crime and punishment. What happens in the story is that the guy, the young man, 
did exactly as his father ordered him to do. And look what happened to him. He was separated from his family. He lost everything he, um, he, he, he got. He started to wander all over. So contrary to what we expected, yeah, this young man, as exactly because yeah, he kept to the word of his father, he was punished so heavily. From the point of view of, of, of Jewish morality, this is impossible. You can't understand it. Now, I don't want to enter here into all the details. What I want to explain is that this story actually is describing the way that medieval Jewish society understood itself. What is the commandment of the Father, the testament of the Father? This is exactly what Judaism is. Judaism understands itself as a chain of tradition. Moses got Torah from Sinai and gave it to, the, to Joshua, and Joshua gave it to the elders, and there, et cetera, et cetera. So what actually Judaism is, is a transmission of morality, of the Torah, of the beliefs, from father to son, from father to son. Now, in medieval life, in medieval society, the Jews are keeping to their Jewish identity. What is this, this Jewish identity bringing to them? Only suffering. Try to think about Jewish medieval life. They are wandering from place to place. They are thrown from, from their quarters. They are a, 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 a killed and, 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 and bloodshed and, and, and all things that uh, um, construct, actually, Jewish life in the Middle Ages. And why is it? It could be easily avoided by losing Jewish identity. This is the heavy burden of Jewish identity that was kept from father to son, from father to son. In other words, what the story is trying to give us is, or to explain to us, or to express, is the feeling that Jewish destiny is a an identity that was transmitted to us from generation to generation. In the reality of medieval life, it is a burden that brings to Jewish society a lot of hardships. It's true that there is a belief that in the future there will be a redeem, the Messiah will come. There will be the savior. But in the present day, it is very hard, very difficult to be a Jew. In other words, in other words, the story expresses the fact that Jewish identity is a, 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 a difficult task. And there is no other way to live Jewish life but to be aware of the fact that this burden was transmitted to us, but if we want to continue to be Jews, yeah, it means that we have to accept the, that reality. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that we have an example here about a Jewish, of a Jewish folk tale that is reflecting Jewish life and identity and mentality of the Middle Ages that has almost nothing with God. Everything that happens there is the decision of the human being, a decision of the father to, 
to, to, to uh, uh, command his son, a decision of the son to take upon himself the testament of his father. Now, um, let me, as, as this is a university of, 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 of a day, let me tell you something that most of you, uh, uh, I think, don't know. In the 1950s, in the early 1950s, uh, my teacher, the founder of, of Jewish folklore in Israel, Professor Dov Noy, came uh, from the United States where he wrote his PhD under the leading folklorist of the time, Professor Steve Thompson in Indiana. And he returned to the Hebrew University in 1952. And he decided to found the uh, IFA, the Israel Folktale Archive. In the, uh, until the 19, early 1960s, there were in the archive about 600, 700 stories that were collected from all the communities in Israel, from uh, Yemenites, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, Kurdish, uh, Moroccans, uh, etc., Polish. Today, that's 50 years later, we have uh, about 26,000 uh, uh, folktales that were collected during those 50 years. And this archive of 26,000 stories is actually the basic data that we can use in order to understand or to answer the question that I initially asked, the question of how did the ideas of secularism penetrate into the uh, uh, larger segments of society. Why? Because all those stories were collected from all the people, all the communities spread all over Israel. Not only the intellectuals, but everybody. And from all, the, uh, uh, from all segments of society. Now, I searched for this medieval story among those 26,000 stories. And I found more than 60 versions of this story told in Israel during, during those 50 years. Now, the tendency of those stories since the 1950s the, the earliest versions I found there were from, the, from 1955 and on until today, is a clear development of a secular identity of this story. Step after step, the elements, the motifs that has to do with religious life, for example, the commandment. Yeah, the third commandment is al almost totally taken from those versions. Yeah, the idea that in the end an, an angel will appear and uh, will give reward to that person disappeared as well. The story is the same, but step by step during those 50 years there is some kind of a feeling that the storytellers who told this story again and again in Israeli, in Israeli life and culture felt that those motifs have no meaning anymore in Israeli reality. And so they changed. And it is very usual in folklore. That's exactly what happens. Folklore is dynamic. It changes itself according to the new ideas, to the new mentality of people, to new culture. So to turn uh, the circle around, I did it only with one story, with one folktale. And I, the question, the initial question was, how did the medieval story from the 9th or 10th century perform in Israeli reality? Now, of course, that the consequences I uh, arrived to are relevant to one story. Yeah, from a scientific point of view, of course, it's not enough. But we'll continue 
I hope, with my students, with PhDs that will be written on the theme, to penetrate into those 26,000 uh, uh, stories and try to ask the same question and then to answer as objectively as possible. Now, how much this idea or tendencies of secularism enter and was spread among larger segments of society and not only the intellectual philosophers, uh, acad academics uh, of Israeli life. Okay, thank you. So you'll be after this point. I, I was interested in, in uh, not just the whole thing, which I, I find fascinating, but the very beginning where you were talking about comparing folklore among different cultures. And I wondered if you would put your philosophy about that into context with like cultural anthropology and Joseph Campbell. Um, 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 okay. Uh, uh, let me only, only, only tell you something. There is no uh, uh, writer that is more detested by folklorists than Joseph Tam Campbell. Okay. <laughs> so uh, ju just, just you know, to put things, to put things in, in, it, in its, uh, but, but, there is no question that the comparative tendency in folklore is until today, uh, for almost 200 years, the basic question we are asking. But there is a very big difference between what, let's say, folklorists in the 19th century asked and what we're asking today. In the 19th century, it was enough to say, you know, this motif has a parallel in India, or that motif has a parallel in South America, and so on. It was enough. Today, we, we are, it's, it's never enough. We are trying to ask further questions. What are the cultural differences that the comparison raised? In what way the comparison is helping us to interpret the story we are interested in in a better way? Even, even the example that I brought you here, because of lack of time, I didn't enter into it. You know, the, the story of that uh, 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 man that never swore an oath, it's, uh, it has a parallel, even maybe a source, in, the, in Eastern folklore. We have in the 1001 Nights, you know, in Arabian Nights, uh, we have two versions of the story that are very similar on the one hand and very different on the other hand from the Jewish, and, and, uh, from the Jewish version. Now, only by comparing these two, we really understand the cultural differences, let's say, between the Persian Ar Arabian uh, culture and the Jewish version that we are dealing with. So the, 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 compar the comparative uh, method is still very, very central in the study of folklore. OK? Thank you. Yeah, we, have, we have your version of the ninth century folk tour, folklore. Yes. But you also said that there was a version or newer versions that you've collected in Israel. Yes. How about giving us the latest version so we can make a comparison between the 9th century and the 19th century uh, or the 20th, the 20th century, century version? Okay. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the versions that was uh, uh, collected into the archive in 1956, I think 1957, Dovnoy found a very interesting method to get to the larger segments. He collected in the summer, he uh, assembled in the summer, uh, teachers from elementary schools all over Israel. Now, that was the time of the Ma'abara. You know what the, the Ma'abara was the uh, transition, ca the transition uh, villages because there was not enough housing, etc., etc. And then uh, uh, he told those teachers, you give homeworks to the children. And in every class, there were children from Kurdistan, children from Poland, children from Yemen, etc., from Romania, and so on and so on. Ask them to write stories from the mouth of their parents or from their grandparents or whatever. And each child you know, wrote two or three legends like this. And those 
texts were sent to the archive. That's why today we have such a, a great multitude of texts. Now, one of those stories uh, was from a Kurdish family <clears throat> where the grandmother told, uh, the, the father, I'm sorry, told the story to his daughter. And the story goes like this. A very poor family in Israel, um, a, 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 a father, a mother, and two sons. The father and the two sons are, went out to look for jobs. They didn't have enough food and so on and so on. And then uh, um, uh, the mother, who was at home, a very big truck stopped on uh, 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 near the house. And the person asked for a glass of water. The mother brought him a glass of water. He was very enamored of her. He kidnapped her, and the uh, a truck went away. When they returned home, they didn't find the mother, and they started to look all over Israel where the mother is. And then uh, the children disappeared because they were kidnapped by someone else. Uh, the father started to be a shepherd. And uh, uh, he was so angry that he wanted to die. And he started to dig a, um, a, a grave for himself. And uh, when, he, when he got deeper into the ground, he heard a knock on something. And he found a box full of money. And he took the money and uh, built a, a cafe on the middle of the road. And the truck, <laughs> the truck started to arrive to that place. And one truck brought his sons, another truck brought his, his wife back, and the family returned to be. This is the story. Now, it's very clear what happens here. This is a total loss of, uh, of the religious belief, of the belief that there is a heavenly power that is conducting life. Yeah, everything there is uh, by chance. Everything there is expressing actually some kind of aggressiveness, of power. This is Israel of the early 1950s. The story reflects exactly those feelings. So that's why I'm saying that folklore yeah, is so important in order to understand those, those uh, uh, mental developments. OK? Yes, please. Do you want to call on one more question, maybe? Um, well, maybe I'll take. Uh, David Beale uh, talked about how secularism is a kind of response to the tradition, um, and that it kind of can't exist without the tradition. Yes. So my question is that it sounds like you're saying that folklore is by definition secular, but given that so much uh, folklore is also in response to many, many traditions, including religious traditions. Um, how is folklore then secular uh, or stripped of that tradition? How are you defining folklore as humanist as, as opposed to a response to okay. I'm, a non-secular tradition? I, I, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't think that that's what I said. I didn't say that folklore is secular. I said that there are, in the, in the example that I brought, there are tendencies to develop some kind of humanist and secular uh, uh, ideology. But not that folklore is in no way. It's simply not true. Okay? Even uh, uh, in the beginning of my, of my uh, uh, lecture, I brought the examples from, from Samuel, from uh, Solomon Ansky, where all the, the, the examples he brings are of totally religious texts. Yeah, even he who looked all his life for secular material. He didn't find it in Jewish folklore in, in Eastern Europe. He simply didn't find it. And you know, if you, you'll think about his uh, play, the Dibuk, yeah, you'll see that all the traditional materials about the spirit who enters the body of a woman and speaks from her body are, are, are those traditional beliefs that uh, existed you know, for hundreds of years. So. Okay. Let's just take one more question. He's been waiting. Sorry. The modern symphonic music that, that emerged in the late 19th and the, the first decades of the 20th century um, harvested um, folk music and wove it together um, and created utterly beautiful things. And I'm wondering if you think that this is a symphony that's, or symphonies that are waiting to be written. 
Yeah, 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 you remember what David, David said, I'm neither a sociologist nor a prophet. So I, I really don't know. But I, I, but I, I will refer to what you asked fr from another point of view. Uh, uh, I, I separated here between, let's say, philosophers, writers, historians, and folklore. This separation is, from many points of view, uh, uh, untrue. Because this separation, in reality, doesn't exist. The greatest artists, from uh, uh, Dante to Shakespeare to our uh, Agnon and so on, used very intensively Jewish folklore in their writings. And from many points of view, the success of Jewish folklore to, to get to many audiences was done through those writers. So it is in, in, in theater in uh, 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 literature, and in music as well. OK, so, uh, so you are totally right. But uh, again, I'm, I'm not a musician, so I, 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 can, I can say very, very little about that. But Jewish folk music, that's, there's no question, uh, uh, became a very important material data for uh, uh, writing modern music. OK, so uh, but just to mention Bartok and, and others. We yeah. have, um, unfortunately, as in each of these sessions, we have already kind of run out of time. We have a short break before our next session, and I want to thank all of you and thank Ellie.